In this video, Sam, Clarina, and I will be covering genetic screening. Genetic screening is a systematic search for persons with a specific genotype. This technique can be used to test a person's genotype for the possible risk for disease or trait. A specific gene will be located somewhere on the DNA of the individual who is being screened. Each gene is made up of a sequence of nucleotide bases. In our segment, we will be specifically covering an autosomal recessive genetic disorder. Autosomal refers to a gene that is not sex-linked and affects males and females. An autosomal chromosome. Specifically, an autosome. Recessive referring to the fact that the gene must be present in both the mother and the father's DNA when coming together to form a zygote. The disorder we are covering is based around the motion of cilia. Cilia are tiny hair-like structures that are found in various parts of the human body. Unique rotary motion called ciliary beating allows these tiny hair-like structures to move particles along the surface. Within each cilium is a set of doublet microtubules. In a person with normal ciliary function, these microtubules interact with each other by means of dynein protein arms, which allow them their rotary motion. A specific genetic disorder, a genetic mutation, leads to the absence of these dynein arms and thus the paralysis of the cilia. Broadly referred to as primary ciliary dyskinesia, PCD. Various genetic mutations located on different genes will amount to the ciliary dysfunction observed in primary ciliary dyskinesia, specific to the function or absence of the dynein arm. In this video, we will refer to a more specific form of PCD known as Cartagena's syndrome. Cartagena's syndrome is a triad involving three types of disorders situs inversus, chronic sinusitis, and bronchiectasis. As Chelsea's mother knew there's a possibility that her child might have a genetic disorder, she, as the parent, can determine what she wants to do with this knowledge. Does she want Mother Nature to go its own way, or does she want to make an informed decision about her motherhood and the health of her child? We will now look at the possible options and which options will be the most suited in this scenario. We will also look at the drawbacks and the possible ethical dilemmas regarding genetical testing. Let's first familiarize ourselves with some of the concepts regarding genetic testing. There are different kinds of tests available, like a newborn screening, diagnostic testing, carrier testing, prenatal testing and pre-implantation testing. So each one of these tests fulfill a specific purpose with different ethical implications. Let's first look at newborn screening. Newborn screening can take place after a child's birth to identify any genetic disorders that can be treated early in life. This is the option with the least ethical dilemmas and the safest for the child and parent. In our case, this will happen after Chelsea's birth to determine if she has the Cartagena syndrome or PCD. Diagnostic testing is a test to identify a genetic or chromosomal condition to confirm a diagnosis when a particular condition is suspected. This test can be performed at any stage during a person's life, but when it is performed on an unborn child, it is called a prenatal test. And this may have several ethical gray areas, as it may influence the parent's decision about the pregnancy. This test would have been performed while Chelsea's mother was pregnant to determine if Chelsea has the mutation for PCD and Cartagena syndrome. Carrier testing is performed on the parents to determine their heterozygosity of a disease and the possibility of their child to carry these genes. This can serve as a preventative measure for parents with a family history of certain disorders. Pre-implantation testing is a test which is used in cases of in vitro fertilization to determine genetic changes in embryos before implantation to make sure that only desirable and healthy embryos are implanted to initiate a pregnancy. 
This genetic testing gives the parents and the doctors the power of genetic engineering. And this too is a considerable grey ethical issue. These genetic tests may be beneficial to identify mutations for certain genetic disorders and it will eliminate some uncertainty surrounding an unborn baby's health. In our case, there is no cure for Cartagena syndrome or PCD and Charles' mother would only have the choice to accept the outcome of the test or to opt for abortion, which is not desirable. But what if there was a false positive or a false negative? Therefore, the importance of the psychological impact of genetic testing cannot be underestimated. The only physical risks involved with genetic testing is when DNA needs to get collected from a fetus through amniocentesis. This poses a risk of a miscarriage, but generally genetic discrimination is one of the biggest fears involved with genetic testing. A few points to keep in mind is that there is always a chance that a baby will not inherit the mutated gene. I would not recommend prenatal screening as there is nothing to be done about the health of the baby before birth in this specific scenario. Most of the risks are psychological and Sam will cover that and give us some more insight into the journey of a mother. Due to the fact that my mother, Kiara, was not present to film the interview, I will be answering the questions on her behalf based on answers that she sent through to us. How did you feel when you were first told that you could not have children? I was alone in a hospital and the doctor just blurted it out. Even though I was 19 and had not ever thought about having children, I was devastated. After Chelsea was born, did you fear for her having Cartagena syndrome and having to go through what you have gone through? Yes, absolutely. She was examined thoroughly and x-rayed immediately. But she was fine and as far as I was led to believe at the time, I should not have worried as this is not hereditary but now I understand this to be incorrect. How did you feel when you found out that you were pregnant with Chelsea? Ecstatic. I was young and not married, so I was a little worried about how I would handle it and what people would say, but I was so happy that we had beat the odds. I didn't really care whether or not the doctors had been wrong. What would be your response if Chelsea wanted to be tested or genetically screened for Cartagena syndrome? I would encourage her to do so. Is there anything from your experience that the doctors did not tell you about your condition? Not that I am aware of. The first set of doctors did not know enough about this condition. Then at the age of 22, I moved to London and extensive tests were done on me and I learned a lot more about my condition, which has helped me manage as well as lessen my fears that I would die of some sort of painful lung disease. If you could, would you go back and change anything? Not really. Although, again, if my parents and doctors had known sooner, the medical treatment would have been more specific, and this may have prevented or delayed the onset of bronchiectasis, the damage of my lungs, which is irreversible. At what age were you diagnosed with Cartagena syndrome and situs inversus? How did you come to suspect or find out that you had this condition? I was 12 years old. As a child, I stopped breathing often and was constantly sick with bronchitis. I changed my doctor who immediately suspected and recognized the condition and arranged various tests and x-rays. What kind of genetic screening or testing processes did you have to go through? X-rays, scans, blood tests, oxygen tests, I have all the original documents. At 19 and again in London, I was asked to have a biopsy of my lungs to determine the exact status of my cilia, but I declined as it would not change anything but may introduce further scarring or bacteria to my lungs. Besides being told that you would never carry children, was there anything else that the doctors told you or predicted about your condition that didn't end up happening? There are many side effects that have not affected me, one of which is clubbed fingers. I was terrified I would get this, although I have abnormal sized and shaped upper sinus. The diagnosing doctor told me that I would most likely not be able to cross the road without being out of breath at age 23. I kept fit, and when I met him again about 15 years later, well over the age of 23, he was quite surprised to see me healthy. From your experience, what do you personally think the psychological effects of genetic screening would be? If you are asking whether I think that an expectant mom would consider aborting a child who may possibly have the condition, myself as a mother and someone with this condition, I seriously doubt this, as you can live a normal life, mostly. I have climbed Kilimanjaro, where the closer you get to the summit, the less oxygen is available. 
This tested me to my limits, but my lungs did not hold me back. However, knowing from birth that your child has a condition, or even an early diagnosis, would allow a parent the understanding of the condition, awareness of the available treatments, lifestyle changes, possible outcomes, as well as linked conditions such as mine, bronchiectasis, and cytosinversus. This leads to a healthier lifestyle as well as a calmer mindset on the condition. Struggling constantly with what looks like a common cold or flu to other people is possibly one of the worst things I had to deal with. People can't understand why I appear to be constantly sick and how it can possibly make me so ill all the time. After all, it's just a cold, but that's not true. All of the images in this video were personally drawn and produced by Chelsea Butler using the programs Adobe After Effects, Adobe Illustrator and Adobe Premiere Pro.